thank you for joining us today. Uh, today we've got for our topic, a uh, tar spot of corn. And so um, we've got two guests to help facilitate the discussion today uh, that are with us. So we've got Dean Malvik with the, he's a plant pathologist with the University of Minnesota uh, Extension in the Department of Plant Pathology. And we also have kind of a, a new thing this week, uh, someone from industry joining us, Nathan Klicheski, who is a uh, uh, plant pathology specialist and entomology specialist with Growmark. So he's based in Illinois and he has some, some uh, wide ranging experience with uh, this particular pathogen and the disease it causes. So thanks to those two for, for joining us today to kind of help facilitate uh, the discussion. Uh, we do also want to uh, thank uh, our sponsorship for today's program. Both the Minnesota Soybean and Minnesota Corn Research and Promotion Councils have helped make this possible. So uh, thanks to those folks for, for bringing this along. Uh, I want to introduce myself, Ryan Miller, uh, Extension Educator. I'll be moderating this session today. Uh, and we, uh, if you're not familiar yet, uh, most people are with this Zoom program. If you hover down along the bottom of your screen, uh, you can uh, use the chat function if you've got technical issues popping up, if your sound's not working or you've got some other issue, uh, you can use that chat function. If you hover to the left a little bit, you'll find the Q&A icon. Uh, and uh, we very much encourage you to put in uh, questions into that uh, box or maybe comments related to the topic today. Uh, it's really uh, important to help guide our discussion. So again, uh, during the session, when things come up, please take some time to enter the, the into the Q&A uh, box. Uh, with that, I'm gonna provide some links uh, in our chat uh, window. So if you access that, there will be links uh, made available through the chat for all the participants today. Um, and so we'll, uh, we'll uh, put some things in there that can be useful as we move forward. Um, but again, uh, I want to thank our two guests, uh, Dean and Nathan. And I think uh, the plan for this morning, Dean, was to have you start off with a couple of introductory remarks uh, to kind of set the stage mm -hmm. for, for the discussion. So we can get started with that. Okay. Thanks, Ryan. And, and it's good to be here and uh, talk about this very important topic. So as, as Ryan said, um, we've invited Nathan to be with us since he's been working with this disease in Illinois for a number of years, both at the University of Illinois and more recently with Growmark. You know, they've had a problem with, uh, with tar spot there a little longer than we have in Minnesota. So they have a little more experience and, and background. And so he will uh, join the discussion here in just a few minutes. I will start by sharing slides. Um, on just to introduce just a few general topics to get all of our minds into the uh, framework of tar spot. Try this again. And so again, here are some photos of tar spot on corn. And just to give a little bit of background about the disease, it's, it's a fungal disease caused by an obligate fungus, mean, which means it cannot be grown in culture. It seems to only grow on basically living uh, corn leaves at this point in time, which makes it challenging to work with in many ways. It produces these small semicircular raised black structures, these little tar spots in the leaves. And it seems that corn at all growth stages is susceptible to infection, although we usually in the field don't see the disease until in the middle of the season, July or later. Um, estimated to reduce yields can be very significant. Oh, Nathan, you can add to this from your recent experiences, but it can definitely be over 30 bushels an acre. Um, although often when this disease occurs, there are also other problems in those fields. So infested corn residue is a source of inoculum, but we also are getting more and more evidence it can be probably spread some distance by wind. Although that exact distance is not yet known very well. It's favored by cool and wet weather, especially wet weather. It seems like wet leaf surfaces uh, high humidity is very important for the disease to develop and spread. And again, it's spreading in Minnesota and across the country. And I'll show you a map in a minute. So here's different levels of symptomology. Often when we first start seeing it, it looks like this picture on the far left, you know, where we see maybe um, 15 or 20 of these tar spots. You know, if we really have sharp eyes, we can catch it when there are a few more, but you know, it gets challenging. And as you can see how it can progress from there all the way to the right. And that progression like that can happen in, in two or three weeks from the point of a few lesions to very 
high levels of lesions and, and dead leaves. And a little bit about the disease cycle. It's very similar to most corn foliar diseases with the exception of rusts, which do not overwinter in the upper Midwest, but it's very likely surviving in residue in the fields where it's been before. And in the spring, when it warms up, the fungus grows, produces or spores that then are transmitted to the growing plants nearby. And we get infection and you can see on the top, um, you can see the black spots. We get initial infection with maybe just a few lesions scattered in the field or in the leaves. And then those lesions then um, are the source of more spores that then cycle in the field. And you can get a mixture of large and small spores resulting in very high levels of disease. And that can then certainly develop to the level where it can kill the leaves. And here's an example uh, from a colleague in Michigan, how the disease developed very quickly over two weeks. If we look at the picture on the left, you can see a couple of things. One, it's very wet. You can see water in the fields. Two, you can see significant levels of tar spot developing already, even at this, at this elevation or altitude. So there was a lot of tar spot in the field on August 24th, but on September 7th, it was a whole different story. Now, undoubtedly, there's probably more than tar spot there, but according to my colleague, uh, Marty Chilvers, the primary problem here was tar spot. And where is the disease now? When it was first discovered in the US in 2015, it was only known to be in North Central Illinois and basically North Central Indiana. And you can see on the gray uh, counties highlighted on this map where it is now. It's spread across much of the Corn Belt, all the way over in Eastern Pennsylvania. And it's been developing also in Georgia and Florida. So it's spreading pretty widely. And if we look at Minnesota specifically, if we look at the map in the center and see the purple spot or purple star in Southern Fillmore County where we first found it in fall of 2019. And up through, I would say August of 2021, we only knew it to be in those counties in the Southeast that are yellow and brown, brownish color, tan color. But later in the fall, um, we found it much more widely distributed, you know, including as far as Eastern Stearns County and Kennebec County. I suspect if we would have been looking really closely at some of the corn that still had green leaves, um, you know, in early, late September, early October, we would have found it even spread further. So it is definitely on the move. It wasn't a significant issue in most of those red counties. But what does is indicate that it is spreading rapidly and it's probably established now in more places than we know. How do we manage this? You know, one is we need to scout for it and find out where it is. And planting the most tolerant resistant hybrids is going to be a key. And more and more companies now are coming out with hybrid ratings for the level of tolerance and resistance. And that can make a big difference. Fungicides can be very effective. And if we're irrigating, we want to do everything we can to minimize the duration of leaf wetness. And I will stop there. There's more information out there. Nathan, you can take over and add your comments and slides if you have any at this point in time. Yeah, I'll go ahead here. Let me, uh, let me make sure I got the right, right screen selected. And everyone can hear me okay, right? Hopefully. All right, so so I'm going to just kind of add on to um, I got oh, good. You can hear me. I'm going to kind of add on to what Dean was was saying, and and uh, as as Dean was mentioning, um, you know I've I've been working on this disease since about 2017. Is actually the first disease I wanted to start working on, and and wrote a grant up for at Illinois, and uh, the grant was rejected because I was told that tar spot was not an issue, <laughs> and then. 2018, we had our first big outbreak, and since then, it's kind of uh, continued to, to spread. And as you know from last year, um, it's it's developing into a, a larger problem. So um, I'm going to focus more on the risks and some of the uh, more details around the management considerations. Now, keep in mind with this disease, um, it is unlike some of these other diseases that 
we deal with uh, foliar diseases like gray leaf spot or northern corn leaf blight or <clears throat> you know in minnesota maybe a little common rust or something like that we know a lot about the biology of those diseases uh, we understand how to work with them uh, with tar spot we've basically had to start from more or less scratch um, as we've started to work with it more in the United States and learn more about it, we realize there are some just gigantic knowledge gaps out there. And so that is why when we do provide you this sort of information, you may say, well, they're, they're kind of, you know, saying hemming and hawing about things and not being really definitive about some of the things they're saying. That's because we're still learning. And in a couple of years, we're going to have more information. So just, just keep that in mind. Um, you're going to have lots of webinars on tire spot, I'm sure, in the future. So I like to, I like to bring this up. You know, we're talking about plant diseases and, and tar spot. And one of the things, and Dean was mentioning this, you know, we've had it in Illinois since 2015 in kind of a, a DeKalb County, that area in the central northern part of the state. Lots of continuous corn grown over there in that region um, and also getting some wet weather that just coincided with canopy closure. And uh, you know, that's kind of caused this disease to, to build up over time, but we see it every year. Do we see yield losses every year? Absolutely not. One of the things that I do tend to tell people is in a normal year, when we don't have a ton of rain pushing through in the middle of the season, like we did this last year, 2018, um, you will see this disease start up late in the season, like after R4, and it'll build slowly. And at the end of the season, when your plants are dry, when your crop is dry, the only thing you're really gonna see are black spots on those leaves. And so what I've observed in my time in Illinois as uh, with the University of Illinois, as well as uh, in industry is that, as Dean was saying, you know, you, <laughs> there's other things in that field as well. And a lot of times, even when we don't have severe issues with tar spot, tar spot gets the blame because it's there. So one of the things that's going to be really crucial for, for you, for your clientele, for your growers, is to make sure that you're out in those fields looking for it. Because those, those maps that Dean was showing, that that just gives you an idea of where we found some of it could be one stroma could be a whole bunch of fields that were just devastated by it. Right. So be out in your fields looking for it because when it comes to management, it, it timeliness is really important. So when we get diseases, got to remember, we have to have the right pathogen. We have to have a, a host that's susceptible at the right stage of growth and a suitable environment. In this case, as Dean mentioned, moderate temperatures, wet conditions, typically after those canopies close is when we're gonna start seeing tar spot disease. And the longer those conditions are together, um, the more this disease builds up. So it takes from onset of disease until we really see it start to explode um, about three weeks, more or less. And you do have a period after infection of about two to three weeks where you won't see symptom development. So this last year was a good example wet and cool, um, infection likely occurred. Then we had this hot, dry spell. And then there are people saying, oh, it's hot and dry. I have stroma forming up on my, on my leaves. Obviously everyone's wrong. Um, that's not necessarily true. There's a latent period there where we're not seeing the symptoms and spores aren't being produced. So um, gotta keep that in mind as we're looking. But we know with factors that are going, going into the season that can help us determine risk. Uh, that includes our field history the production practices, how we're managing that field, and also our, our, in this case, hybrid because we're dealing with corn. So we already know, if we're talking about disease triangle, we know the host, we know the likely pathogens that are there, in this case, tar spot and potential abundance. That's going to be based on um, how severe the infections were last year in that field or in the surrounding fields, as well as how much of that residue is still on the surface. And then all we need is the environment. Right. And when those things come together, that's when we get tar spots. So you start asking yourself this question. Did you have it last year? Was it in nearby fields last year? You start saying yes, checking off those boxes, your your risk increases for getting it. And then how severe was it? So that's the first thing you're going to ask yourself. And then what are your plans this season? Are you going to be in conventional tillage, burying residue? Um, now, I, I 
I understand there's different types of tillage that um, you're going to have gradations of residue remaining on the field surface, but uh, removing some of that residue can reduce the initial amount of the uh, organism that's there to cause disease and therefore potentially minimize the ultimate amount of disease, especially if it arrives kind of mid late in the season. Rotated acres, am I rotating corn with a non-host such as soybean, for example? And then the big one is, as Dean showed, irrigation, right? It's always, it's always going to be raining under the pivot. So if you're in irrigated acres and you've got a field with, you know, history of this disease, corn on corn, going corn, again, your risk is going to be pretty high. Um, the other thing I, I tend to tell people is delayed planting is really important. And that's one of the reasons I tell people really to look at data coming from timing studies with a lot of caution, because the, the, when you plant that plant is going to determine uh, if tar spot does arrive is going to determine what timing works best. And it's also going to determine the ultimate severity of that disease, because let's say we have two uh, fields here, same hybrid, right? Everything's the same, uh, but we got one planted at our normal planting date for region, one that's delayed by you know, a few weeks, okay? And they're actually calling for this in some areas with forecasts this year. So let's say we got July 15th, we got tasseling occurring in our normal planting date. We got, it's still, you know, in that vegetative state earlier there, but we've got two weeks of just persistent wet weather, just like last year that come in July 25th, about 10 days later. Um, tar spot's going to show up, maybe R3, R4, and that one start to develop, right? That's getting later in that window when uh, we're going to see significant yield loss because because once we get to R5, we get black layer, our yield's been made. And the other one, we've still got a long window a lot of opportunities for that disease to really cause some, some issues for us. So this is kind of what I, I put together for, for our folks to kind of have them um, kind of work through this. You know, how are we gonna come up with our risk before season, determine where we're gonna have more challenges than others. Um, and basically this is just kind of a tool that you're able then to use and, and kind of determine relative uh, relative at the beginning of the season where you're going to be at. Again, if this is recorded or whatever, I'm also happy to share this with Dean and everybody else. Um, culturally, y'all are familiar with Fusarium head blight. I tell people this is a regional disease. Once it's established, um, even if you do some local stuff uh, with residue, it's still going to be moving into your fields. And we know that it travels much further than what had been reported previously in Latin America where it had been established. So we know it's at least three quarters of a mile. It's probably a lot more than that, especially when you get into flat topographies in the Midwest. When we do our res residue management type work, it's really hit or miss. Has to do with not only the degree of reduction of residue that we have, um, but also the fact that you have spores that are going to be moving from nearby fields and regions. So just because you're tilling a field, it doesn't mean that you're going to eliminate that disease from getting into that field. But also if you have any residue that still can serve as a source. So we had, you know, we've had some work where we've been able to reduce it by 16% by R5 when we're, we're um, digging down um, our residue from 85% to 24% on the leaf surface. Other studies, no effect at all. In a serious year like last year, unlikely to see any differences. All hybrids, I tell people, all hybrids are going to be susceptible to some degree. Everybody's got some that do better than others. And I would call those that do better than others, in this case, the left side of this graph, um, those are going to have maybe part what we call partial resistance. So you do not hang your hat on those hybrids and say, I planted a, a resistant hybrid. I'm not, I don't have to worry about this disease if the conditions are conducive. It still will show up. It still can build up and it still will take down those plants. I mean, just look at the severity here at R5. You're still at almost 30% on those leaves. Um, in my experience, you hit about 30, 35% severity on those leaves and they start to shut down, those plants will shut down really rapidly. So in this case, everybody in that field is, is at that point where they're going to be shutting down. So uh, silver lining, we're gonna know which ones are better or worse because of the outbreak, 
Doesn't mean they're necessarily super resistant, but we do have some publicly available materials that have been identified. Hopefully those will start getting worked into some of these breeding materials. And maybe in the next few years, we'll have something that's really, you know, we can really hang our hats on resistance wise. Fungicide efficacy, if we look at some of the uniform trials that have been conducted uh, for several years here, and, and you know, that I could show a bunch of, of individual trials we've conducted, but it's got more impact when we look across states and years here in different conditions. These are the products that tend to do a little bit better. Um, in general, I tell people two modes of action are going to you know, give us an advantage over a single mode of action fungicide. Um, those that have three modes of action are good as well. But this, in general, this is what we're seeing in terms of performance when they're applied at that window, that VTR3 window. We also see in this particular case, um, this was a trial we did in Monmouth, a little, a little heavier disease. We had some good yield responses this year. Again, different letter, letters indicate significant differences. Um, all of these are going to be reducing with the exception of tilt. Um, reducing your severity relative to that non-treated check, but some are going to be better than others. Um, so that's what I try to tell people. You have your Cadillacs. Uh, I don't, I'm not a car guy. I guess Mustangs might be below Cadillac. And, and you might have a Pinto every now and then. But uh, when it comes to managing tar spot, that first spray when you're investing in it at VT, don't go cheap on that one. Um, that's when you want to make sure you're, you're putting on a, a decent product with at least two modes of action. Um, is there a threshold? I'm not a big fan of thresholds for diseases just because of the disease triangle and how hard it is to, to deal with that. Um, but I do tend to tell people if you start seeing it at 3% severity at, at that, you know, leaf below the ear leaf or in the middle to upper canopy before R3, an application might be a, de a decent call. Um, just make sure that if, you know, if you make an application, that um, you know when it went on relative to that cool wet weather because you get about a three week window of protection with your fungicide. And uh, that means that if it comes in late, you went in you know, early planted VT um, and then disease started about three, four weeks later, it still could blow up. It doesn't mean your fungicide didn't work. It just ran out of gas. Um, at the same time, if you come in and make a, reven a revenge spray after it's already established, you're not going to be able to stop that disease from occurring and it's still going to show up. You're still going to see stroma and it potentially can uh, continue there too. So those are, those are my slides and I'll, um, I'll go ahead and, uh, and just kind of stop sharing my video there. All right. Thanks. Well, so one common question you guys that comes up is, is related to, you know, this concept of systemic fungicide. And, and so some folks are putting on a fungicide in, in more of the vegetative stages. <clears throat> and then probably more commonly, this kind of be that more the, like the BT timing. And I, I don't know if you can speak to that a little bit, make some comments in regards to when to expect protection to run out and, and you know, what might, I don't know, make some comments around those. Yeah, I, I can start. I mean, as Nathan said, you know, um, if we're thinking about tar spot, we don't want to get the application on too early. You know, an early vegetative application probably is usually not going to be the most effective for tar spot. And so that that's certainly one one factor we need to think about. Um, is that is that the main part of that question, Ryan? Yeah, and then also, so then uh, let's look at a more typical timing around uh, at BT. If you're using one of these Cadillac uh, fungicide programs, you know, is, you know, you should never like say, well, I'm, I'm set, I'm covered now. But uh, if you're at that timing, is there, what's your risk then as far as, you know, at, at later reproductive stages to see that breakdown and maybe see the need for additional fungicide if, if, if you're in a high risk environment, high risk situation. Yeah. So Nathan, I think you, you already started that commentary. So why don't you just kind of build on what you already said? Yeah. So if you are, if you're going in with a planned application at, at tasseling R1, uh, silking, you know, you're going to be protecting yourself for three, uh, about three weeks. And that, more or less goes across the board with the exception of if you're going on with like a straight triazole fungus, like a tilt, that's probably one of the reasons in that one trial, maybe it, you know, it doesn't work as well. 
Um, those triazoles, they hang on about two weeks. You get about two weeks of ac activity. Um, the other SDHIQ-wise, they'll give you about three weeks of activity. But anything more than that, it, you know, you're not going to really see the fungicide doing any real work for you. Um, and the other thing we have to keep in mind, we talk about systemic when it comes to fungicides. They're acropetally systemic after they're applied. So they will move, they get into that waxy cuticle, they move through the water in the leaf to the other side of the leaf and maybe up with the water as well into those established leaves. It's not as if they're just going to be moving up and down the plant and you're just gonna get this magical protection. Um, they get diluted, they get broken down by UV rays, they may even get broken down by um, rain, depending on if, if they didn't get in, you know, you put it on before rain, it might not get pulled in. So that, that's another reason why those early applications, all you're protecting with the early applications are leaves that are present at that time, which are usually going to be those lower leaves in the canopy. Um, but the majority of the leaves that we want to protect are going to be the ear leaf, maybe the leaf below and everything above. That's going to be about 90% of the carbohydrates you need for grain fill. So that, that's one of the reasons why that VT to you know, R2 application windows has been and continues to be the sweet spot for making, um, making those applications. A second application after, after uh, a VT application in the majority of instances isn't going to be something that's going to be cost effective. Um, but in cases where that call has been made, I do say you can get by with a cheaper fungicide on that second application because you're just trying to cover that window from basically maybe R3 to black layer. So, so you don't need as much gas to, to reach your final destination. But I, most of the time, you're, that's not going to be a cost-effective way of doing business. Okay. And a question that came in, uh, and not through the Q&A box, but through the chat. So if you got questions, please try to get them over to the Q&A box. But uh, uh, the potential to have a curative fungicide, it's everything you guys are saying, it sounds like we're very much in a protect, protectant kind of fashion. Mm -hmm. Is there anything such as a curative fungicide when it comes to this disease? I think the answer is no, and you can build on that, Nathan. Yeah, I mean, you really have to think about what curative means. And I think we, uh, you know, I was having a discussion with somebody. It's almost more of a marketing term. I like to call it post-infective. And really the only window we have uh, with fungicides to get rid of something post-infection. It's a two to three day window after that spore is germinated and starting to basically quote unquote, dig its way into the tissue. If you come in after that, that fungus is already deep inside the tissue and growing. So you might slow it down a little bit as that active gets pulled from the cuticle in into the tissue, but the likelihood of being able to actually kill it and prevent it from continuing to develop and take nutrients from the plant is, is pretty minimal. So um, the quote unquote curative activity you get from a fungicide more than a couple of days, you know, if you're lucky. Do you guys, uh, do we have a, a resource we could put up then as far as you showed some data from these kind of uniform wider scale trials? Uh, is there, is there a good link that we could put up for uh, information as, as far as what fungicides people might consider if, uh, if they want to do a little research ahead of time before the growing season? Well, the first one I'd mention is there's a website called the Crop Protection Network. Crop Protection Network. You can find that easily if you search for it. Um, the easiest resource to look at is there is a, a table of uh, fungicide efficacy for corn fungicides that's updated each year by plant pathologists across the Midwest. And, and, and for example, some of Nathan's data is in there for our spot, as well as other universities and states. So it gives kind of the relative efficacy for different fungicides on a scale from poor to very good or excellent. It doesn't actually give numbers, but it combines information from many trials to give that sort of general rating. So that's, that's one very good summary source. I, I believe there's also some summary data published on there. Um, 
in, in, a, in a few instances, but I can't recall exactly what that is. Do you remember, Nathan, his specific trials? Um, yeah, I'm not sure if, if there are, um, if, if the summary data goes up. Sometimes Crop Protection Network, if there's something that has been published in a, a scientific journal, they'll try to publish a layperson summary on there. Um, there's, as far as I know, nothing for tar spot, but a lot of times what you can also find um, if you go to plant disease management reports, uh, that's those. That's a resource I think that also can be utilized. So those are going to be individual one-off um, efficacy trials at different locations and different researchers across the U.S. will conduct them. So you can go in if you have, if you have access to that, you can actually search for tar spot or corn or whatever. And you can pull up these different trials and just get information. Otherwise, good areas to go, you know, go to uh, look at, you know, some of the, um, the, the universities and, and the people that are doing the, uh, the extension work oftentimes will publish their results on their websites or um, mm -hmm. on their uh, individual web pages. And a lot of times include those there. So I know, you know, myself in, in Illinois, we had our applied research guide. Um, publish that every year. I would put my trials in there. Purdue does the same thing. Uh, Wisconsin does the same thing. I'm not sure about um, the other places, but that would be another good place to look. Right. Yeah. And I see Angie has put that link to that, uh, what you mentioned, Dean, into the chat box. So folks that are looking for that, they could they can jump into the chat box and see that uh, she posted it to everybody. And I know, Dean, you've done some, some at least some preliminary work with some fungicide trials and have more planned in the future, so stay tuned. I'm sure there will be um, crop news and other reports as we move forward from, from work done here in Minnesota. So um, with that, uh, I want to jump back. Uh, there is a biology question that came in right away. Um, you guys mentioned it, this fungus being an obligate parasite and that it, it needs to, to have a host to be here. Well, the question is, how does it overwinter then as far as uh, uh, continuing itself? Yeah, it can survive on tissue that's that it has infected, and that's that's the, the the simple answer. It can't it can't grow once, as far as we know, once the tissue is dead and dry, but it can survive. And but once that tissue becomes moist again in the spring, um, spores that are probably already in those um, overwintering um, stroma, those black spots can then be spread. So that's, I think that's the basic answer to that. Um, so it can survive kind of in a dormant phase and then produce spores and then continue its life cycle on the new plants. So then there's, there's kind of a follow-up question from someone else. Um, so in, you just answered the first part of their question about tar spot overwintering on corn residue, which yes. Um, but then they're asking about a, uh, residue digestion spray to help control it. Uh, hmm. Has anyone heard of that or where's that coming from? And, and Yeah, so there are some products out there um, that you can put on in the fall or in the spring that will uh, contain microbes. And the idea would be that the microbes will break down um, the residue more quickly if you've got a lot of it on the surface. Um, that's something that to be honest, I, I've, I've got some trials out because I was curious to see if that would do anything, um, but there's no real data on what those would do. My, my initial you know, thought is even if they did work fabulously and, and really reduce residue, that doesn't prevent you from getting the disease in an epidemic year, right? It still can blow in from across the street, from down the road, from other fields. So um, it can delay the amount potentially of onset, but it's not going to prevent, prevent you from getting the disease. So it's just a, it would just be another potential tool in the, in the tool belt for management. So kind of breaking down the source locally, but not preventing things from outside. That's right. Uh, so here's a question. I know there's been a lot of interest in this, uh, in fungicide treatments, um, has anyone looked at impacts uh, on this particular disease with any any of that uh, product type? 
Um, so the inferral fungicides, it's, they're going to be akin to those early vegetative applications. I realized I had a really terrible typo on my presentation. I want to say invest your fungicide spray at VT and it said V5. So that it's supposed to be VT. Um, those, those applications that are going in in the ground um, at furrow, they can move. Some of them can move systemically. They'll move into some of those uh, tissues, the lower leaf tissues but they're not going to have any kind of, you know, they're not going to replace a VT application. And as we mentioned earlier, a lot of times we don't see this disease show up until those canopies close kind of that mid late in the season. Um, so they most likely aren't going to have any kind of uh, benefit for managing tar spot with the exception of if you're like in a really late planted field, as I mentioned in the example, then you might see a benefit, but I'd say in the majority of cases for tar spot, probably not gonna do a whole heck of a lot. Okay, uh, so we've had a number of questions kind of come in about this sort of scouting and or more maybe more apt uh, uh, predictive sort of tools that might be out there, you know, I know with head scab of wheat, there's was a model that you could access and kind of see what your level of risk was. Uh, in particular, one person on here mentions this tar spotter app that uh, Damon Smith from Wisconsin has been working towards developing. Uh, but I, you know, there was another question earlier on. Well, again, around this app or mobile device about predicting tar spot and in. Do you guys want to make any comments about work that's being done there or, or the challenges around that? Well, I tend to start with a couple comments. You know, there's, there's a few things here that play into this. So there is that app and that model, that risk assessment tool being developed. But as Nathan said, there's still a lot we don't understand about this disease. And so a lot of the variables that go into that model are, some of them are a bit guesswork still. I think it's going to keep getting better and better, um, but we have a lot to learn, I think, to really optimize that kind of an approach. And I haven't used that extensively to see how well it matches up where we've seen tar spot in Minnesota. Um, Nathan, how about you? Have you looked at it in terms of where you've seen tar spot in Illinois? Yeah, and you know, we were working on it with initial development. And as you said, there's a lot of, there's a lot of gray area there. Basically it's using visual observations of tar spot occurring in a field relative to various environmental um, conditions. Um, does it work? Kind of, um, you know, it, it will get better, um, but it's based on, it's based on symptomology um, and you know, again, I don't, I can't say whether using hybrid A and a hybrid B, if I get infected on the same day, will I still have a 14 day latent period with, with these two, is there going to be something genetically that might differ, mm -hmm. you know, um, or, or am I, you know, have a fungicide and there's something that's maybe slowing the onset of that one versus this one. So, so there are, are, are things like that. When you're basing a tool just on symptomology, there's all this other stuff that gets thrown in there that are assumed that may not be correct. And so when you look at a tool like Sporecaster, I really like that because it doesn't predict the symptomology of white mold. It predicts when the spores are going to be released. And if we know the spores are going to be released, then we know given, you know, we, we just plug in a couple other things if we're going to be at risk. Um, the other thing, all it does is tell you if you're at risk for some tar spot, it doesn't tell you that um, you need to manage it, right? Um, so that's something people have to realize too. You can be at risk for tar spot and only have three stroma show up in a field, um, or you can be at risk for tar spot and have your field completely hammered with it. So at this point, I don't think there's any way of really differentiating that alert. Um, so I think it's a complementary tool um, that you use in addition to scouting. And I find it to be, it's probably going to be most useful if you are, um, you know, in a situation where maybe you're not 
think you don't want to make an application, but you're you're concerned that hey, maybe tar spot's going to show up. Maybe can, people have been jimmer jammering about it. Then you might start looking at that and say, well, I've been at risk here for a while. You know, maybe I should I should put something on, or or maybe I don't have to. You know, because the models tell me it's low risk. So. So Nathan, before we we started the the presentation today, we had a little discussion before things kicked off, and then you mentioned again in your slides that. Uh, tar spots a real conspicuous disease. I mean, it's real evident when you get out there and you're harvesting and, and, and so there's this kind of danger to blame situations on uh, tar spot as far as, you know, yield loss or maybe a, a lower yielding field. What are some of your experiences with that where people may have pointed the finger at tar spot, but really there were different underlying issues that, that may have been the cause of their, you know, limited yield? Well, uh, in 2018, in a lot of fields where we had susceptible, like northern susceptible uh, hybrids, uh, if, if you were in those fields earlier, they were getting hammered by northern and tar spot. So there's a, this kind of, you know, they, you may have had a 30, 40 year uh, bushel yield loss, but at the same time, how much of that was tar spot, how much of that was northern? Um, that's that's something you got to think about the conditions that favor tar spot favor a lot of foliar diseases mm -hmm. so that's why i tell people that the best tool you have is yourself and your truck or your car whatever it is you drive could be a minivan is get out to your fields and try to look at them while those fields are still green and it'll give you an idea come you know when things are dried down what's causing the problem in parts of illinois this year Low yields blamed on tar spot where, yes, there was tar spot. Did I think there was enough to significantly like cause a major yield loss? No, but we had a lot of wet weather earlier and I was in those fields and we had a lot of nitrogen loss. So I'm getting nitrogen loss compounded with tar spot. Um, and up in Wisconsin, I've had people tell me, well, I think we got a lot of tar spot blamed on us, but it was rootworm. You know, I think that was the cause of it, but if people aren't looking for rootworm. So again, the key here is just being able to get out there and, and look at your fields and, and pay attention to what's going on. That field history is the best piece of information you can have to manage any issue in your field. Great. Some good points. I'm glad you brought those, those out. Um, hey, uh, so there's a question here about the damage potential from this disease. Is it worse, do you think, in in the upper Midwest in our corn belt uh, or than, than the potential that it was uh, where it natively was from? Or do you have any thoughts about that, I guess? I, I, I don't. I, I know it can, it has been a significant problem in some areas in Central America, for sure. Um, I, I don't know how the loss is compared. I mean, it was significant enough. Certainly they put breeding efforts into developing hybrids, you know, adapt to the region that are resistant to the disease. Um, but I don't know how it compares and, and whether the key point I think for us is that it can be a really significant problem here. You know, it can cause a lot of yield loss. Yeah, I, that's, I totally agree with that. I mean, regardless of what happens in the South or what differences or similarities we might have, it's, it's a problem here. We do have a couple of extra things probably going for us that they might not have in, in Latin America. Flat topographies, uh, just like widespread acres of continuous corn production. Um, and, uh, you know, and, and the fact that there's been zero effort put into breeding for tar spot resistance. So what we have in terms of materials out there is I kind of I've, I've told people think about head blight when we first started having issues with head blight. Now, 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 granted, I was a teenager when this stuff happened in the 90s, but those those first resistant, quote unquote, resistant cultivars or varieties that came out. If we would take those and put them in a lineup with the moderately resistant wheat uh, varieties that we have now, I bet we would call a lot of those first generation resistant varieties as being moderately susceptible to maybe almost susceptible compared to the ones that we have now. So, you know, we're at that stage with tar spot where the best stuff we have isn't good enough. 
but in a few years, a few iterations, we'll, we're going to hopefully start to push that more towards where we need to be. And that's, that's, you know, we're finding new sources of resistance that are publicly available that people can include in breeding programs uh, that becomes really important. Yeah, one other point about comparing what we have here compared to say Central America is the disease seems to be a little different there. They associate the significant loss uh, with a complex, um, two different fungi, not only the R tar spot fungus, but another fungus. And they see a lot of these so-called fisheye um, symptoms, which are larger lesions, basically the black spots surrounded by a chlorotic to necrotic halo. We don't see that as much here. So again, they, they seem to associate the greatest loss with a complex of two fungi. We don't have that second fungus here, as far as we know. We have not been able to find it in any fields. So we have a little different disease. In fact, when the disease was first found here, only the one fungi, fungus of that pair was found here. And some people speculated that maybe it wouldn't be a big problem here because only one of those fungi were here. Certainly that didn't turn out to be true. So again, it's coming back to the point that there's a lot we have to learn about this, that this fungus, this one fungus can, can be a big problem all by itself, which wasn't known you know, five years ago, six years ago. Excellent. Say, uh, we did have a question come in and uh, about this moldy condition that happened uh, in many cornfields uh, across Minnesota this last year, this, this black mold and, and uh, there was a question about that. Uh, I know Angie and I think Liz wrote an article on the crop news blog uh, in regards to that. And, and Angie was able to post the link into the chat box. So uh, I want to call attention there. Uh, do you guys want to make any comments related to that fungus? Um, I, I don't, you know, it was, it went in well into Iowa and Wisconsin, other places too. I think we just had the right environment to get a lot of this saprophytic fungus growing on a lot of corn, produced large amounts of spores, as many people noticed. Um, it, it didn't seem to be a pathogen so much of corn itself as just a saprophyte living on the, the, the maturing tissue. Um, you know, one of the things in the, in the chat was there was a question of how dangerous it could be to people that were harvesting it and breathing in the spores. You know, we're not sure, but we, we never want to breathe in a lot of fungal spores. Uh, that can be a big problem. Okay, good, good, good points. Now, along those lines, what about uh, the toxicology related to tar spot? Has anyone looked at any potential toxins or, uh, you know, for the uh, animal person out there, animal farmer uh, looking at silage corn, uh, is there any concerns there? I, I'll just add a couple comments and, and Nathan, you can take off from there. But to my knowledge, there's been no toxin associated with this fungus itself this, that causes tar spot. Uh, so that's, that's that. And in terms of um, its effect on, on silage corn, you know, it can, I, I don't know if it would affect palatability in the end if there's enough tar spot or yeah, I'm, I'm not sure. I think we have more to learn there too. Nathan, you want to add anything to that? Yeah, so I totally agree with, with Dean. There's no evidence of these fungi, uh, this group producing toxins. And in fact, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but if I, if I go back into my pathology brain, a lot of times obligate pathogens, because of their lifestyle, don't produce these toxins because these toxins that get produced oftentimes are there to kill tissues, make lesions, and then they live off of that dead tissue. What I, what I will say is that in conditions that favor tar spot, there is, <clears throat> there's some work that well, hopefully it'll get published someday, but um, there's a, uh, you know, in these areas where we do have um, a lot of tar spot and the leaves are turning brown, you'll get Fusarium, which is a very common genus of fungus that will colonize those dead tissues. Um, so you might have, because it's been wet and, uh, you know, the conditions favor a lot of these fungi, you could have secondary colonization by other fungi that could produce uh, toxins. 
Um, but by itself, tar spot doesn't produce a toxin. So, um, and in terms of you know, palatability, digestibility, yeah, there's a lot more work that needs to be done there. Um, but I would think it's going to be very similar to some of these other diseases where if it's severe enough early enough, uh, it, it might change some of the, the composition of, of that corn silage. Uh, but again, that's work I think mostly in Michigan and maybe Wisconsin has some, has some data on that, but very kind of preliminary type stuff. Okay. Well, good to know. Uh, there was a question here regarding tillage systems, and I'm, I can anticipate how you're going to answer this, but uh, are we seeing more tar spot and no-till versus a minimum till situation? Hmm. I, I think what you guys have been saying all along is the source isn't necessarily local, so you got to think broader than right where you're at. And so I, I don't know. I just put those comments. Yeah, I, I don't know if we see more tar spot. I guess there's two elements to more, meaning how many plants are infected or how severe it is. You know, as, as Nathan said, we might get earlier infection if we have the pathogen present in a field where there's a lot of residue on the surface, you know, maybe versus having it blow in, it may start a little later. But if we look late in the season, we still might have 100% of plants infected, although maybe at different levels. Um, Yeah, Nathan, you want to add anything to that? Uh, yeah, I mean, I've been in fields that have been in soybean continuously first year corn that have been smoked with tar spot. So, you know, it, it just, if the conditions are right and there's enough inoculum out there, it, you can get infections. It doesn't mean that if you, <laughs> you know, you're at zero risk, as in that table I presented, if it, if you don't have tar spot, it doesn't mean you're at zero risk for tar spot. There's other factors that are involved mm -hmm. and it can spread mm -hmm. pretty far, but just because you've been in soybean for years and this is your first year in corn doesn't mean you're not going to see it this year. So you still need to be out looking for diseases and out in your fields. Yeah, I can just add to that saying we've, I've seen been in fields in Southeast Minnesota too, where there was, there hadn't been corn the year before maybe for at least a couple of years. And there was a, a very high level of tar spot late in the season. All right, excellent. And I think that that answers a lot of questions here uh, and kind of summarizes that. Now we did have one comment come in here from Bill Halfman, uh, working in extension in, in Wisconsin. He's got a lot of experience with corn silage and has kind of a cautionary note here that one of the challenges with tar spot of corn is that in corn silage, it's when you have an infestation, it's going to dry down really fast. And so it can create uh, challenges with timing that, that cutting and chopping and, mm. and getting, you know, the right moisture to, to, to meet your storage needs. So, so just a, just a key point uh, that he is, uh, he is uh, experienced with um, and just wanted to put that out there and yeah. thanks Bill for adding that two cents. Uh, really appreciate comments like that. Uh, another question, uh, Question. One the final question, I guess we got for today because we're running short on time, uh, is about this ID standpoint. Uh, and we didn't spend a lot of time talking about identification, uh, but the particular question comes in: uh, tar spot versus northern corn leaf blight. What are what are a couple of pointers maybe you give people for mm -hmm. making a positive identification for this particular disease? Yeah. Okay. So so tar spot is as I showed in the photos it produces these small black spots that are slightly raised on the surface of the leaf. And you, know, you can have lots of them and they can ultimately clear, kill sections of the leaf or the whole leaf. But nonetheless, you always see these small raised lesions or called stroma, these fungal structures. And sometimes there's some confusion between them and insect frass or, or other just dark spots on the leaves. And so you can, if you take a wet finger and rub it across the tar spot, tar spots, you know, they will not come off unlike say insect droppings. And one other thing, I'll get to Northern corn leaf blight in a moment, but late in the season, it, it can be confused sometimes with rust. Rust, spores, pustules, pustules especially as they mature can become very dark. But they, once you look at them side by side, they do look different than tar spot. 
So northern corn leaf blight, in contrast, produces you know, long uh, kind of canoe-shaped lesions that may be an inch long or maybe two or three inches long. And it's a more or less uniform colored brown spot, typically lesion on the leaf versus these discrete spots caused by tar spot. Okay, well, thanks, Dean. And maybe if we could post a link to, uh, to some ID uh, resources, I know we've got a number of them, we'll put those in the chat box. But uh, with that, I guess we're really close to the end here. And I wanna thank our two uh, speakers or specialists here today to help uh, answer questions and facilitate the discussion. Well, thanks everyone that, uh, for participating, uh, as well as our sponsorship from Minnesota Corn and Minnesota Soybean Research and Promotion Councils. Uh, when you exit the show today, uh, you'll be asked a, a short three question survey. We'd really appreciate it if you take some time and answer those three questions for us. It helps uh, provide feedback for future programs. And so uh, thanks again to everyone and uh, uh, see you next week.